Good evening. I'll invite you to take your hymnals and open them to 637. Hymn 637, we gather together, and when you find it, please stand. Let's open the service with a Lord of Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. We thank you that the uh, services of morning went well, Lord, that everything um, was in ship, ship shape, Lord, that it was great for you, that everything was honoring and glorifying to you, Lord. I thank you for bringing us Ben today. Pray that you be with him as he gives us the message later, that you give him the words to say, give all of us open hearts, whatever it is you have for us, Lord. We pray for the Bergie family mentioned earlier, Lord, that you would continue to be with them, be with the family, be with Lys uh, Lissa, Lord. Um, that if you be your will, that they would find a, um, a cure, Lord, they would be able to have the surgery and it would fix the seizures that are ongoing. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with this time. Bless it, Lord, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few announcements for you before we get on our way. Um, you all have your bulletin, so I won't go through every single one since there's quite a few of them. Uh, but obviously we have sort of a special service tonight. Um, ben and Jen will give their testimonies just a little bit later. Um, but we ask that you'd stay after with us, that you would have the snack time out in the gymnasium, a time of fellowship, uh, to ask Ben questions, to greet him, to talk with him, um, but also to just greet one another as we um, have so often. Uh, the missionaries of the month, I didn't mention this morning, but it is the Folks family. Um, so if you'd like to grab their card, uh, this is not, this is the last Sunday of the month. Sorry, this is the last Sunday of the month, so we'll have a new one next week. So please grab that one, add it to your ring. Um, I know they'd greatly appreciated it. Um, obviously, the Berge family that we mentioned earlier, uh, continue to pray for them, but also uh, the next three weeks, if you would find something extra or have something extra that you would like to give, please just designate it as you put it in the offering uh, or bring it here. Whatever you want to do um, can be done, and we'll give it to them to help with um, traveling expenses, the expenses of all of her medical bills. Um, she's only nine from what I hear. Nine, she's under 10, correct? Um, so it's a hard thing to imagine, a little child going through that, uh, and the stress that it can put on a family as well. Having to bring all 10 kids back from South Africa. Um, so that was a trip in and of itself, but then also her continual um, decline in her seizures and everything like that. So please keep them in prayer, and if you have something extra, uh, please do so. Uh, the men's prayer meeting this week on Tuesday. Men, you're going to want to hear this one, okay? They're meeting at the Valley at 9 o'clock. So we're no longer meeting here. They're going to go to breakfast um, at 9 o'clock. That'll be the normal men's prayer meeting. Um, so don't meet here. Meet at the Valley. They moved. It's over on Elms Road now. Uh, so make sure you get the right one. Uh, the ladies have a couple different activities coming up. May 8th uh, is the trip to um, the village. So if you've not yet signed up, please do so. As May 5th will be the cutoff date. And then May 11th, so busy week here in a couple weeks. Uh, will be the ladies' luncheon. Again, if you have not yet bought your tickets, please do so for that. Um, I don't know how many names are signed up yet, 
but I know we can fit a lot more, so please do so. Um, next week also, it seems like May is just like a really busy week, I mean busy month, um, obviously. So next week though, May 4th, uh, we are having our roundup, our gather together, if you will. Um, I know we used to call it at the school, uh, prayer at the pole. So kind of that kind of thing where we'll meet together, we'll have a little bit of a breakfast, uh, a challenge, a devotional, and then we will get on t with our work. Um, Laverne has requested if you plan on working outside to bring gloves. Um, so whatever Laverne has planned for you, you better have gloves because you know Laverne will make you work. So please do that. Um, and then also next Sunday we'll be voting um, during the evening service on Ben and Jen. So you also will not want to miss that. Uh, before the men come, we have another song. And before the offering and the missionary letter will be Children of Our Heavenly Father. It's hymn 123. The choir sang this last time Jennifer and I were here, so the melody should be fresh in your minds. So sing out, we are children of our Heavenly Father because he died on the cross providing um, atonement for our sin. So please join in with me. I'll let you stay, uh, sit this time. Um, and the words are on the PowerPoint also. Yeah, that's Nancy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sometimes the light, my eyes, you know. Uh, well, the gleam on the head, Jerry. <laughs> All right, that was it. Okay. Jerry, if you want to come on up here. Uh, listen, uh, uh, round up, it's 9 o'clock. Was that true that you wanted to bring breakfast? <laughs> well, we'll have it. He's just laughing and giggling back there. I don't, okay, I don't know what to make of that. Anyway, time of prayer. Everybody, we, we have a place and whatever you want to do to help. Let me, let me again inform you about the Bergie situation. It's a long process. She's had to go undergo quite a lot of extensive uh, testing. What was good is that during the time she was in the Boston Children's Hospital, she suffered quite a few seizures, but that was good because it allowed them to see firsthand with the hookups and all the wiring, the EKG, where they could see. She's gonna be out for a little bit, but then she'll have to go back in some prep work before surgery, then the surgery and then she'll have to be there a little bit. And then she'll have to stay in the area afterwards as they continue to monitor and watch her. It's pretty critical. And of course, even though they adopted her from China still, it, it's a heavy burden on them as if it was their very own biological child. And I think that if we think about this and you, you ask the Lord what you could do to give, I think it would just be an extra blessing 
for us to rally and do something. They've not asked for anything, but they just said, well, here's our needs and our prayer requests. We have a lot of unexpected expenses. Ask God to supply and take care. But I think at this time, this would really be a good encouragement. Uh, be sure and mark it so. If you give in something in an offering envelope, make sure it's marked for the burgies. If you put it in with your regular tithes and offerings, be sure and designate on the envelope what that's for, okay? And we'll get it to them. I was pleased with the response of so many for the chat list. And I do think this is a situation that even calls for more attention and seriousness on our part. So let's, let's be behind them and pray, okay? And again, whatever we have coming up here, even the vote next week, we seek to do the will of the Lord. Let's pray and ask God to direct us. Uh, Ben's got a lot on his plate. He's got to pay for a new wife. Yes. You know, it was an interesting story we learned at lunch today about them. When they first met, she cared nothing at all for him. And um, I said, well, what changed? Well, I guess time. She figured, you know, he's not too bad. Kind of reminded me of when Susan and I first met. I don't know why. I've never been able to understand that she didn't like me. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand that. You know. But she came around, didn't you, dear? <laughs> well, there's a lot of other blanks to fill in there. But anyway, we'll be praying for them, of course, and the, their upcoming nuptials in June, June 29th. And, of course, as we look forward, we have some great things going on for the summer. And pray for our VBS that will be coming up, our kids' youth camp at the end of June. And uh, we can really see the Lord work and move in there. And uh, it's always good to hear from our missionary letters. So, brother, you come and read to us tonight. It's interesting what we're going through with the Burgies. And... Um, and it occurred to me while Pastor was talking about them that when we take on a missionary, we take them into our family. They become a part of our church in absentee, but they're part of us. We hear about them, we read about them, and we, we learn to love them and care for them, just like family. So it's, it's interesting how that came to me as he was talking. Well, let me read it to you from the Smiths serving in Ottawa, Canada. And they're talking about an outreach service update. At every service, we remind those in attendance that we're working toward planting a church in the, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Veneer or Vanier. It's in Canada, French. What would it be? Vanier? Okay, I'll use that. Community. We have an attendance of about 15 to 20 people every Sunday morning. Please pray that we will establish a committed group of believers that desire to be members of a new church. It is encouraging to see some of the faithful people serving in small areas of ministry at the services. They had a baptism. We were rejoicing that we had our first baptism as a direct result of the outreach services. Please continue to pray that people will make decisions to put their faith in and follow Christ. They had a birthday. We celebrated Kyle's, their son's, 16th birthday. Another striking reminder of how fast time goes by. We are proud of the young man he has become in the ministry. Our daughters and their friends sing a tri singing a trio uh, at a Vanier service below. Congregational singing at a Vanier service. And they show some pictures. Now I have another letter to read. That was a very short one, so we'll do two tonight. This is from the Gerhards, who have been in China for six years. And that alone, just being there, is, is an amazing thing to me. Um, they're traveling, April 2019. Dear Gospel Partners, we spend much time of March and early April on the road. Kristen enjoyed an AP calculus training course in Cheng, Chengdu. And then I had the chance to attend a Simeon Trust workshop in Port Dixon, Malaysia. 
Wow. These intensive preaching workshops provide a great tools and feedback, feedback for word work. The workshop covered 1 Timothy. I was particularly helped by one presenter's constant inquiry. Why is this passage in this place? Driving us to trace the flow of the author's argument. I was also able to connect with the international director of the Charles Simeon Trust. Lord willing, will, Lord willing will have the chance to introduce local Chinese brothers to this ministry in the fall. Thank you for praying for the exposition workshop that we hosted here in Wuxi on March 23rd. I invited all the men that were, I'm mentioning, I'm mentoring to attend, and most of them came. We worked through Colossians 2 and 3 this time. Next month, we will finish chapter 4. The format, format is learner-driven participation. As everyone comes prepared to present their under, understanding of the context, structure, theme, and gospel connections in assigned passages. The bulk of our time then is spent discussing those presentations, providing encouragement and feedback for each other to grow and prove as faithful preachers. In our nearly six years in China, we've been blessed by frequent visits from family. Our home church sent one of their assistant pastors to visit us. Of course, having grandkids to visit here didn't hurt motivation to make the trip. Our boys have been getting a year's worth of hugs in. The Currys scheduled their trip over the boys' spring break, so we were, able to, we were also able to get away and to Beijing for some family fun. Uh, for language learners, you might find this review, and it's a, a site on the computer, of a language learning assessment tool useful. Prayer request. Pray for health. Pray for us to endure well during a season of colds and allergies. Pray for the Waxai International Fellowship. This summer, our International Fellowship will be seeing many people move on to new work and ministry. Pray God will continue to provide for our spiritual needs through his body. Church leaders prayer list. Last month I shared this prayer list that you can still download to pray for the men God has allowed me to minister with in Christ. In Christ, Nathan and Kristen Gerhardt with Sam, Gabe, Max, and Cal. I'm going to have this. Um, offering now. Fellas, would you come forward please? Jim, would you pray, please?
Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer and I have a song that we would like to teach you guys tonight. Don't get scared. Jennifer is going to play it one time through, and then I'll sing all four stanzas. Then I'll have you guys stand up and join with me. And then we'll sing it at the end after, after I, I share God's word with you guys. So let's listen to Jen play the first stanza, and then I'll sing the four stanzas, and then we'll stand and sing it together. Please follow along with the music and words on the stage. wonderful privilege of being here and being able to give you our testimonies. While Jennifer is coming up here, she will be giving her testimony first. We're so glad to be here with you guys today. This morning was very, 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 very wonderful. And Wednesday, being here to pray with you guys and seeing your heart for your missionaries was also very dear, dear to me. Jennifer, share with us your testimony and a little bit about your upgrowing, your upbringing. Hello everyone, I'm Jennifer Swedberg, soon to be still well, uh, 62 days I think, so we're excited. Uh, so some of you know that I grew up in Brazil, South America. My parents are missionaries there and have been there now. They're celebrating 25 years of being there and as a couple. So my dad actually grew up there, so altogether he's been there pretty much his whole life. 
So as you can imagine, I was in church every Sunday, no option given. And I'm very thankful for the training that my parents gave me and for how they uh, took the time to share the gospel with me, not just in church, but in home, at home uh, when we would do our family devotions. And so it was ingrained into me when I was very young that I was a sinner. And um, from what I hear, I don't remember much, but apparently I was a very terrible toddler. Uh, so, and, and I'm very thankful for the discipline of my parents and um, how they showed me God's love and mercy in disciplining me and helping me know my fallen state that I needed a savior and I could not um, go to heaven of my own good works or any other way that I could devise. So I remember, I think I was five years old, I don't remember exactly how old I was, um, walking home from my friend's house with my dad and asking him how I could be saved. And he explained to me that I needed to put my faith and trust in Jesus and what he did for me on the cross and how he died and rose again to pay the penalty for my sin. So that's what I did when I was five years old, I believe. I think I was five because I know I was baptized when I was six. So uh, not too long after, I remember asking my dad about baptism. And uh, he, I was baptized and joined our church in Brazil in obedience to the Lord's command. And, you know, being such a small child, I don't think I understood fully all the implications of what my faith in Christ um, entailed in my life. But uh, growing in the Lord through um, the example of my parents and also through um, training in uh, Bible college and everything has helped me uh, to continue growing in Him. And it's just a wonderful joy to serve Him. And uh, so, yes, I think that is my testimony. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Amazon and Andes Mountains in Peru, South America, my parents were also missionaries there and also have finished their 25th year as missionaries there. My grandpa went down there early on and my, my dad also grew up there. Something Jennifer and I share is we have this wonderful lineage uh, of missionaries and we praise the Lord. It's nothing we boast in, it's something we praise him for. So I also knew from a young age that I was, I was a sinner. My parents were on furlough. We were living in Lafayette, Indiana, which at the time, Faith Baptist Church was my parents' sending church. We were in their housing um, right next to the church. That evening, during family devotions, my dad did something a little different. He brought out this book that had tons of colors, but no words. It was the wordless book. And my dad, and I was excited, I was excited. It's like, yes something different. Um, so I was five years old. So he turned the first page. The first page is black. It represents the sin in my life. And I knew that all had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that sin, the wages of my sin was death, eternal death. Turning the page, it was red, uh, like a crimson red, a scarlet red, which represented Christ's blood, which was said, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. Turning the page after that was white, which I knew, oh, the blood of Christ wash away the sins of, of my life, and whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so I knew that, I knew all these colors, but it still in, it did not make sense to me in an impactful way. I had made no decision. Turning the next color was a, was a different, different type of color. It was gold. The rest of the colors were normal, bland colors, white. But this sheet was reflective. It was, it was uh, metallic. You could see a reflection in it. And my dad explained, Benjamin, if you put your faith in, in, in the finished work of Christ, you accept him into your, your life, you will someday, when you get to heaven, either rapture or death, you will have a new body. You will be beautiful. And you will sing for Jesus. <clears throat> this is the part my future wife really likes, sing for Jesus. I was a little tiny soprano boy. I would walk around house singing very, very high, and at the point my mom would say, you know, you need to stop. You're just a bit too high, high shrilling. And so I thought, you know what? In heaven, Jesus is never going to ask me to stop singing. No, that's not a shame on my, my mom or my, my parents. But in that moment, I realized, you know what? I want that. I want to be washed with Christ's blood. I want to have him as my savior. 
I want his atoning work to be in my life. I just used some big words, but I didn't think of those words when I was little. But in, in some way, I understood. So I said, Dad, I, I really want this for my life. Took me aside to their bedroom. We, we knelt next to the bed, and my dad, opening up a little bit more of God's word, made sure that I knew. And on that day, without a shadow of a doubt, I put my, my faith in Christ. And I know someday I will be with him in eternity. With many of you, I hope to. But the book's not done. Uh, we never finished the book that evening, but the last book is green. And green refers to growth. It's beautiful what we see outside. We were talking with Pastor. It's a vibrant green, a deep green. A green that represents the growth that we have in Christ, that we should have. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, something that we learned in Sunday school today with Brother, Brother Bob. And that is what I, I, I'm working on in my life. It's not always easy, has ups and downs, but, but it is my goal to grow and to love God's Word and to study it. I was later baptized uh, a couple years later and added to the membership at Victory Baptist Church, or Iglesia Bautista Victoria. Um, two people were added that day. It was a young lady. Um, she's not following the Lord anymore. And so my burden has always been for college students, for young families. Somewhere around the college years and early family life, uh, people go off the deep end and stop following Christ. So Jennifer and I have that burden. We, we love college students and we love, we love young families. And so we're looking forward to possibly being brought on if you guys will have us. Well, that is our testimony. We're going to ha- hear an... Uh, English horn solo by Jacob Lebonte, I Sing the Mighty Power of God, which is a wonderful truth. Not only did he make the mountains rise and spread the flowing sea, he saved us, which is the biggest miracle of all, from our death, our black sin. Thank you. You guys are privileged. One, really well done, Jane, Jacob. Very few churches have an oboist that can play in tune. But you guys heard an English horn. Those are very rare, rare to hear in churches. So keep it up, Jacob. I'm rooting for you. All right. Let's transition into what we have for God's word today. When um, Pastor gave us a call, we, he came up and visited us shortly afterwards. And one thing he told me about the church was that the church was praying for 100 new young families. This kind of excites me. Um, we're soon to be at that stage in our life, Jennifer and I. We definitely want to be part of the outreach and discipleship of God's growth in His church. While Jennifer and I are kind of young in this area, um, and we don't quite understand some things because we're not married yet, we do know what God's Word says about the family. And I thank God for, for the wonderful lineage that Jennifer and I have. Jennifer's grandparents, um, his grandfather and her father are solid theologians. You're going to find that out soon. Um, Mark Swedberg will be coming to to preach on June 9th, I believe. Um, they're great expositors of the word. Her grandmother and her mother are wonderful counselors. They've been really key in a lot of ladies in their church, and even some young men. They're fervent counselors. On my side of the family, my, my father and my grandfather are family counselors. They teach at the Bible College, um, fervent stu- students of God's word. 
So Jennifer and I have been given an outstanding testimony of, of what God can do um, when, when fathers and parents train up their children the right way. We're not first generation, we're not second generation, we're fourth generation believers. My grand, great grandpa got saved in his teen years and dedicated his life and was in camp ministry and missionary work. So this evening I would like to present to you something that is very dear to my heart, to Jen's. I believe that a successful church um, needs to take this topic very seriously. It's essential. It was essential to the nation of Israel, and the topic for today is a practical one also. So I'm going to invite the men. I have to start handing out the handouts I have. I think um, this will help keep us on track. Uh, not only do I want it to help you keep stay awake, you'll need a pencil, you'll need a pen. Um, also, I want you to take this home. Keep it in your Bibles, and I think it will help us in this topic. And the topic is family worship, the how and the why. Family worship, the how and why. So once you get that, please take your Bibles and open them to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. I am also a teacher. I taught one year at a Bible college, and I'm currently teaching at a high school in Troy. So if you guys bring me on, Lord willing, if that's his will, have a pencil when I preach. I need a pencil. So I have divided this sermon on family worship into two sections. The first section will talk about the why family worship is important and essential. And the second section I would like to give a practical explanation on how to have family worship. So I'll begin reading. We'll read our main focus will be Psalm 78, 1 through 8. So I'll start with, with the first verse and read through. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which ye have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generations to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they, may, they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please give me clarity, give me wisdom as I speak on an essential topic, a topic that you think is very important. Lord, might we understand not only how important it is to be worship, a worshiping family in our homes, but we put it in practice. And might our practice, our participation of family worship at home reflect here in our local church. In your name we pray. Amen. So here we have Asaph. Asaph is, you could say, the court musician of David, the temple musician. He's the main guy. Most people think Asaph wrote this. I think he did. He wrote Psalm 51 and then 73 through, through 83. Asaph is uh, uh, interesting here. We have verses 1 through 8 where he's actually starting off kind of like an introduction. Then we have verses 9 through 12 where he gives the reason why. He gives a little background, what's on his mind. And then the rest of the chapter is actually kind of the history from the, the exit of, of, of um, Egypt all the way until the rule of King David. So probably what would have happened is actually Asaph would have given, gotten up and, and spoken. And then 13, verses 13 and on to the end of the chapter would have been sung or chanted with accompaniment of strings and, and brass and probably some timpani, timpani drums. So, 
Obviously, we have mus uh, Asaph's purpose in the psalm is to give a summary of the history in a musical form, warning against rebellious attitudes. Therefore, Asaph begins the verse commanding his audience to listen. We see, give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. This is not a foreign idea. Lots of psalmists have used actually in Revelations. We see something similar. It's a common thing. So give ear. O oh, my people, to my law, incline your ears to my words. It's important. Here he's, just, he's talking to young families. He's talking even to older, he's talking to everybody, but I think he really is targeting families, uh, young families. Why? Because he says not only incline your ear to me, he says listen. Listen to the words of my mouth. There is one way that we can, we all hear, but not every time do we listen. So when you have a little child, you can tell them something, or as a teacher, I tell them something, but it goes right out. So Asaph is really trying to get their chance. He says, listen, pay attention, take to heart. He says in verse 2, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. This is a little, here he is kind of drawing in his attack, his, 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 um, his audience. He's telling them, hey, I have something important. This is what it is. We could say that the parables of old are just declaration wise sayings. The dark, the dark sayings are actually just wisdom, wisdom of old times. The first part of the verse, he's simply implying he has uh, wise sayings to saying. In the second part of this verse, he previews the purpose of the verse. I will utter dark sayings of old. is speaking about the mysteries of the past, which we see later in verse 13 and on. The thought in verse 3, where he says, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us, here we see the wise sayings that Asaph is going to speak are known to the current generation and were taught by previous generations. Now, after reading this first verse, I had to think, then what is the purpose of him saying it again? Why is Asaph talking about this? If they already know it, then what's the purpose? And he, he clarifies that. If people already know this, then what's the purpose? And he clarifies that in verse 4. Not, do not hide them from their children, showing the generations to come. So Asaph is worried here that people will stop telling the history, the laws, the importance of having their hope in God. We can kind of see that even through history of our, of our generation here. Generations are, ha, have fluctuations. And I think a lot of it is about what parents talk about in, in their home, what they teach their children in their home. So today we're going to have three points for our first section. The first point that we will be talking about is that family worship provides generational testimony. testimony. First point of why worship is so important is family worship provides generational testimony. So we have verses 4 and 6. Um, Actually, you can see this pretty much through all eight verses, but we're going to focus on four and six. One of the greatest benefits of family worship is the actual passing on of your faith to the next generation. We are teaching our children how to read the scriptures, how to pray, how to confess sin, sing unto God, and more. Our children will leave the home with memories of their daily worship. This is important that they go on to college, that when they establish their families, they have memories of, of, of their up, up growing. And by God's grace, we hope that the mercy and his mercy that we will care, they will carry it into the next generation of families. I really value what my parents have passed down. Um, it's, it, it, I cannot, I, I, maybe when I was a teen, I, I was rebellious. I really was. Um, when I was a child, I know I disobeyed. Um, but now as I'm getting ready to take this step into a new family, I, I realize how important it was. So... Within this generational testimonies, I would like to draw out two points, two subpoints, if you will. The first one is that um, generational testimony reinforces spiritual headship. That A, um, generational testimony reinforces spiritual headship. We'll talk about that in verse 5. The B of this would be that it trains children in corporate worship. So. Family worship provides generational testimony. It reinforces spiritual headship and trains children. So let's go to verse 4. Spiritual headship in family is essential, essential for generational testimony to happen. We see the example of this in verse 5 where God establishes his testimony in Jacob, who taught it to his children, and through Moses the law was given to the children of Israel, that they may make them known to their children. 
Family worship reinforces the biblical framework of a family as it looks further. Or, and in this case, the father leads, or if, in this, if there's a single mother, then she is a spiritual leader at the home. As the father leads his children and wife before God's throne in daily, daily worship, as he disciples them in things of Christ, they will increasingly look to him for spiritual leadership. This has the added benefit of reinforcing the father-husband the spiritual mantle that is upon his shoulder. So this is really important. I think this is actually kind of lost in our culture. Or even in, even in our culture in South America, thinking about it. Who are the ones that usually show up first from, from the families to church? In an unsaved family? The mothers. The mothers bring the children. And usually we pray hard and hard, and often cases the father comes to know. How amazing, and every time I've seen this happen, when a father is the first one to get saved, everybody in the family comes to know right away. And so it's very important that we keep this, this God-given headship of, of the family, the father, and he is the example. As Christ is our example, the father of the church, I'm um, sorry, the, the cornerstone of the church, the husband of the church, so the father is the head. It is important, and, and l let, me, let me clarify and, and show you the importance of this headship. So we think about Israel, it is very important to understand this. Israel did not have much corporate worship. They didn't have churches. It wasn't actually until during the Babylonian captivity and then the Maccabean revolt, revolt that synagogues started popping up their version of churches. And actually, you wouldn't be allowed to have a synagogue in a city unless you had 10 Jewish men. So actually, whenever worship um, instructions are given in God's word, it's usually implied that they're supposed to be applied to the family, that the father is supposed to teach them. Now, there is a few cases that we have in Nehemiah. We have when Solomon erected the temple. And a couple of these psalms are actually for corporate worship or once a year at the Passover or every seven years for, for certain, for certain um, feasts when all the, the children of Israel would come together. But largely, up until the Babylonian captivity, worship, corporate worship, actually was just family worship. Most of them met for, for the Sabbath, their Sabbath. They had this meal. It was dedicated to the Lord, and they would worship. It was a time when the, parent, the fathers would teach their children. They would sing as a family. Actually, we, we still have those songs that they sing, and they still do it. They have symbolic meals during the Sabbath to teach their children the Exodus and what, what God has done for them. So actually, we have these synagogues being erected, New, Ter New Testament church, um, God and in, Christ institutes that. Paul takes it all over the place. And then fa uh, church worship becomes to become a prominent thing. Then in the around 300 AD, the Catholic Church starts to s change some things here. And, there. and actually, worship becomes less involved by, 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 by the people sitting in the pews or actually in that time standing. And then it's not until 1517, when Martin Luther comes to the scene, that corporate worship in church starts to happen again. And it's important. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because it's part of our history. It's part of Christianity. And Martin Luther is well known for having these things called table talks, where his family and sometimes friend would gather around, they'd read a scripture, they would pray, and they would also sing songs. Martin Luther was not only an amazing theologian, he was also a musician. He played the, the flute and the lute. Fast forward all the way up to here. Most evangelicals now are very aware of the importance of secret and corporate worship, as in your devotions and then what we do here at church, but fewer practice family worship. You see, worship begins in the home. The value of this cannot be over underestimated. Family worship provides the added benefit of training our children for corporate worship. As they sit and they listen to the Word of God, hear the prayers, sing the hymns, these elements of corporate worship become very, very um, part of them, ingrained in them. Let's go to verse 6 here. In the, in the verse 6, the phrase that the generations to come might know them signifies the importance the parents teaching their children is to knowing the statutes of the Lord. 
to know the Psalms, the wise sayings of old, as well as their history, so that when the nation of Israel came together for feasts, everyone knew how to worship corporately. So, if we were to spend time as a family in our homes, worshiping the Lord, singing, praying, we teach our children how to do that, we teach them of the Lord, we teach them the hymns, when, they come, when we come, to come as a family to church, the kids already know what to do because they've been trained at home. And this kind of overlaps, this whole idea of training our children in corporate worship kind of overlaps with our second point of why family worship is so important. And the second point, which we see in verse 7 and 8, is that family worship centers the family. It centers the family. Family worship has the wonderful effect of centering our home upon Christ. In our fast-moving society, there are few things that family do together anymore. Even eating meals sometimes is really hard to do. It seems like a feat. What if families gather together daily? What if they gather together for worship? It would probably be the most important time of the day and a central aspect of that family's life. Your entire family, our entire family, coming together a realization that no matter what else we do or don't do, the most important thing that marks us as a family is that we are worshiping the family. We are worshiping family, and this is a time separated together, where we are together. And that bond is going to be eternal, an eternal one. It strengthens the family. Verse 7 and 8, let me read those for us and remind us of them. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their hearts aright, whose spirit was not steadfast with God. These verses explain a few ways the family worship centers and binds the home. The first one I would like to propose to you is that it encourages Christian character. We see this in verse 7. It encourages Christian character A. The verse encouraged the Israelites to set their hope in God and to have hearts that keep God's commandments. In verse 8, the opposite of a good Christian character is described as fathers who were stubborn, rebellious, that set not their hearts aright, whose spirit was not steadfast in God. The home act is probably the hardest place to live out your Christian lives. Jennifer and I were realizing this when we started off our relationship. Everything was hunky-dory. Everything's beautiful. The flowers are bright. There's not a cloud in the sky. But when you get to know each other, the bond is built, and slowly you, for, you let your guard down. And it's easy to start getting angry. It's start, easy to start criticizing, to tearing down one another. And families, it's funny, we often, we often treat the people worse. That, the people that we know, we treat the worse. And that is why if we center our family, our worship, on Christ, and we enc it encourages good character, and that helps us live out our daily lives in the home. There's a reason Paul lays and addresses each member of the Christian family in the household. He has Ephesians and Colossians. It is a sad reality that we often manifest the character of Christ more consistently in church, in the workplace, in the community, than we do in our own homes. If there's somewhere that I have most especially let my guard down and, my, and let the flesh in. It's definitely been at home. Growing up, I see it even now. Jennifer and I are quite married, but been dating for a long time, and I, it worries me sometimes. Christ, God, change my heart. I don't want to treat my, my future wife like this. So it encourages Christian character. B, we also see that family worship encourages peace in the home. We are given example, an example of the tribe of Ephraim in verses 9 and 10. They, they lacked peace. They came from, from, and they were rebellious at heart. We are all sinners living under the same roof in tight quarters. This is a recipe for disaster. We know our family members. We know them well. Family worship helps us confront our sin and understand its effect upon one another. For example... Uh, it is awfully hard for a father who just sinned against his wife. He 
he, he spoke wrong of her, criticized her, to then go straight from that and lead family worship. It is very hard. My dad, I called my dad this weekend. I said, hey, is this true? He said, yes. And usually that causes my dad to prepare his heart, which means he asks forgiveness of the Lord and asks forgiveness of my mother. Now, my mother probably might have reacted wrong. I don't know. My mother might have reacted wrong, but it's also hard for her to react wrong and not get right with my father before family devotions or family worship. So this idea of congregating for family worship also helps us have peace and encourages peace in our home. And then the obvious one we see, well, backing up into verse 4, is that, see, it encourages godliness, children to godliness. Children are, are a wonderful example of where Christ um, needs to work in people's lives. In verse 4, we see that we will not hide them from their, from their children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. It's interesting, the word praise here would be like praiseworthy deeds. His strength, His wonderful works that He had done, He's referring here to the, the last part of the psalm. He starts off saying, we will not hide them from our children. And here he's not actually referring to say we will not hide these songs, we will not hide these teachings, the law. He's actually referring also that we will not hide our example, our example of teaching them to our children. It is very important that, that parents, especially fathers, have a good example to their children. Children see, they see a lot. They see if mom and dad worship. And they also see that see when mom and dad worship not just on Sunday. It is something at the very core of their being. It's important enough that we center our home on worship. And when dad is constantly saying, it's time for devotions. When dad is getting out the hymn book and opening up the Bible, the child will imitate. They're good imitators. They really are. When the mom is singing and, and helping, her, helping her husband lead worship, children see that becomes part of them. Before we move on to the practical side of, of how we should do family worship, I would like to add one more benefit to family worship, which is the utmost importance, and that is the third point, which um, family worship honors and glorifies God. I'll go ahead and ask you guys to turn to Psalm 73, which is also written by Asaph. Psalm 73, 25 through 20, 28. We must not forget that our primary purpose and call is to honor and glorify God. And actually, one of the biggest things I remember growing up was um, in our devotion series one year, we, we decided to, to go through the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Now, don't get all scared with this catechism. My dad is a theologian. He knows how to how to help us kids out, and actually it was really good. Basically, um, this is where the book asks a question, it gives an answer, you memorize the answer and the question, then it gives a verse, and you memorize the verse. And I remember, I don't remember all of these because there's, there's hundreds of them in this book. We went through all of them. At one point, we had them all memorized. But I do remember the first one, and the first one, the question is, what is the chief end of man? The answer is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And the psalm actually states that in verse, in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed them all that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. And this is, family worship is a wonderful time to honor and glorify God. We will draw close to Him. We will go over His mighty deeds. We will put our hope in Him, and we'll declare to our kids the wondrous works that God has done. So let's review a little bit. 
we have our first point, which is family worship, the why of family worship. Why should we have? Why is it so essential? One, it provides generational testimony. And under that, we see that it, in generational testimony, we mean that it reform, reinforces spiritual headship. It trains children in corporate worship. Our second point of why, then, is family worship centers the home. It brings it together. It encourages Christian character. It encourages us to live Christ-like. It sets, apart, it sets aside a time where it makes it important to be together as a family. And as we encourage, as we encourage Christian character, in character, it also encourages peace in the home. And we want that. That is a good thing. And as there is peace in the home, the example of the parents, we see that it encourages children to godliness. And all of this is under the umbrella of that. We are, we are here on earth to honor and glorify God. All right, turning the page. Turning the page is the practical, the how. Um, I, here I'm going to be leaning a lot on notes from my dad, and then a book that I will soon recommend. I'm not quite there. I have, I, I'm have. i almost there. I'll be married in 62 days to Jennifer. We're getting married in Iowa. Really looking forward to this. Um, so I'm leaning a lot on my dad's notes uh, and things that I've, I have learned over the time. So family worship is a time set aside. It's a time that you all agree on that this is a sacred time. And we're going to talk about big families, small families, young families, old families, single families. A little bit, I'll give a little, I don't have too much time, but I'd like to at least mention some of those things. The first thing I want you to realize is that family worship, family devotions, is not a church service. It does not have to be three hours long. It can't be. Try talking to a toddler for three hours. It doesn't work. Truthfully, for younger children, it could be five minutes. Maybe at the most 30 minutes as you go on older and older, but a lot can be done in 30 minutes when they're in their teen years. Five minutes, that's a good place to start if you, if you have a very young toddler, but you can do so much in five minutes. I'm a teacher. I have a very, I'm very scheduled. I like to write my rehearsal plans, and next to my rehearsal plans you'll see from this time to this time you're doing this, from this time to that time you're doing this. So it can be done. So, to help us remember, my dad uses the three S's, the three S's of family worship. The three S's are one, scripture, two, supplication, and three, singing. We'll go through and talk about this. Now, scripture, reading the Bible is the core of family worship. What you read in the Bible will depend on the age of the group and the dynamic of the household. So you're not going to start by reading Numbers. Numbers will be difficult. You're not going to start reading Leviticus. Honestly, when the children are, are little and they're learning to read, probably the, 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 the book of John has words that they're a little more familiar with. Choose a good version. Um, do not pull out this... Don't, don't pull out a very, very old version that you can barely understand. Find a good version. Actually, Pastor and his wife can probably recommend some good versions for you. Maybe even read the children's Bible. I, when I was little, I had this little tiny summary Bible. I had little pictures in there. Read it through with them. Maybe take time to read a, ch a missionary story with them. Maybe read a devotional book with them. Maybe just read one verse. But make it, make, it, make it very important. Be passionate when you read. Take time to explain the big words. It's really not only an educationally good thing for you to do that. It's also uplifting and it teaches them about the word. Um, be clear. Ask questions. So, for example, Johnny, what do you think this means? Well the child doesn't know, then help him, help him understand. Or it's a good time for the wife to put their husband on the spot. Honey, what do you think this means? And to tell you the truth, there might be times where you have to say, I don't know, but that is why we have pastors. <laughs> and you know what? I think that would be the most happiest, that, you would make him happy if you came and said, hey, pastor, we were reading this in family devotions and we don't understand, help us out. I think that's the problems he would love to have more often at, in church. 
So you got a, you got a great resource over here. Let's move on to supplication. This is just a fancy word. I think my dad came up with supplication just because he wanted to stick it with the three S's. Um, but supplication just means prayer. Take time to pray as a family. Take time to teach your children how to pray. And they will want to pray. They will volunteer to pray. I had a little brother, he volunteered every time, and we're like, oh no. Lord, thank you for the silverware. Thank you for Bobby the dog. Help him to like his food. Please pray for the dear saint that's sick. They remember. I think it's very important. You know what's another great thing? Prayer cards. Missionary prayer cards. Not only can you keep them in a little tiny box or put them on your refrigerator, but bring them to, bring them to family devotions. Let the children see the picture. Let them hold it. Visualizing it for the children does wonders. They will remember. They will pray. And outside of family devotion, outside of family worship, when they're in bed and you're praying with them, they will bring, they'll pray for it. Visualizing it for your kids is important. When they get older, in their teen years, teach your children to read through passages of, of the Word. Read a psalm. Find ways to pray through the psalm. If you are older, if your children are out of the home, this is a wonderful time to study God's Word, especially if you're retired. I look forward to retiring. I'm going to sit with my wife, if, if I'm still alive, sit with my wife, and we're going to read God's Word. We're going to study it. We love studying God's Word. You have time to do it. Do it. Grow closer to God. Pray for your church leaders. They sure need it. You know what they have to put up with. Pray for them. They need it. And it's actually, they will, they, and the children will see that, and they will come up to their pastor and say, Pastor, we prayed for you. You don't know how encouraging that probably will be to him when they do that. Prayer. So we have, we have scripture. You have to read God's word. Read, read missionary stories. Read something. Maybe just a verse. Explain. Supplication. Pray. Pray as a family. Not just at your mealtime. Take time. Set aside to worship and pray. And three, we have song. Now, singing together as a family might be a little awkward, at least initially, especially if you have teen year, teens. Teens are, it's not cool, Dad. Not cool. Given it some time, it w it's good. And you just have to push through it because it's important. We, I have talked to Pastor about this. This is my personal strong conviction that hymn books really do belong at home. Over the years, people have stopped singing hymns. We sing hymns here, but there's still a lot of hymns in our hymn books that we don't sing. And if we sing at home with our kids, it's, it's hard, it's awkward, I know. But when we come to church, they'll know the hymns. Here's a good opportunity. If you don't know the hymns, if you don't know the melody, you struggle with it, if you, one of your kids don't play an instrument or you don't play an instrument, talk to your music pastor. He'd be very happy to help you. Um, if it's the Lord's will, if you call one. He would be happy to pray. Take your bulletin home. Don't just throw it in the trash. It has the list of the hymns there. Choose a hymn each day to, pray, to sing. You sang it on Sunday, so you shouldn't have forgotten it by then. Sing through them. Or if you're learning a hymn together at church, sing it at home. Back at the welcome desk, I have put the hymn that we learned this evening. Put the music there, the words are there. At the bottom, you're going to see my name and a phone number. I encourage you guys to pick one up for your family. Sing through it this week as a family. If you forget the melody, there's a phone number on the bottom. Give me a text or a call. I'd be happy to send you a link to, to a song, or I can call you and sing with your family. It's very important. Also on the back of the wel welcome desk, there is going to be a little book. It's a very short book. There's a little tiny picture on it. This it has some more practical information. Now, Jennifer told me, Benjamin, if you put this on the back there, you might never see it again. That's okay with me. Please, if 
you want to know more, take it, read it, put it back. If, if you want to buy it, it's a w really good book. I encourage, I encourage. No family situation is unique. This book deals with many of those situations. Now, a conclusion. I usually give a propositional or a theme statement at the beginning, but I've chosen to do it at the end. Um, so get your pencils ready. It's not that difficult. The propositional statement for today is a worshiping local church, a worshiping local church foremost worships in the home. A worshiping local church foremost worships in the home. It all starts in the home with families. The local church is made up of families. Even if it's a one-person family, it's made up of families. We see all over in, in, in Scripture how important worship is in the family. Take time to praise God. Take time to read God's Word. Take time to pray. Take time to sing. And this, if you do this, if we are a church that worships at home, it will raise our worship here to new heights. If we worship at home, if we are worshiping families at home, our family here at church, the church family, will, will worship wonderfully new heights. Before I invite Pastor to come, I would like to sing that hymn we, song, we sang at the beginning one more time, that new hymn. It will be up on the PowerPoint. Then after this, I'll, I'd like to ask Pastor to come up and, and lead us in a word of prayer and close us out. I invite you to please stand, get the blood flowing, and join in me with, with this song. Sue, would you take them back to...